it's critical. Effective communication is critical because without good comms, change fails, period. Bad comms equals failure of whatever you're trying to achieve in this organizational change. This is the ERP Organizational Change Journal podcast, brought to you by Nestle & Associates, a Newport Beach, California-based ERP organizational change management firm serving the private equity industry. The ERP OCJ seeks to share expertise, insight, experience, and research, and to create effective conversation to help guide ERP organizational change to real, measurable, and verified success. And now, here's your ERP expert and host, the founder of Nestle & Associates, Dr. Jack Nestle. Hello everyone, Jack here. In this episode, we dive into effective ERP communication strategies for business IT alignment. We explore the essential tactics and strategies to build the gap between IT and business systems, ensuring successful ERP implementations and organizational change. Our discussion will benefit IT professionals, business leaders, and anyone involved in ERP projects seeking to enhance collaboration and drive project success. Joining us today is Chris Fenning, an expert in simplifying complex communications between technical and business teams. Chris is an award-winning author, sought-after speaker, and university guest lecturer based in Limburg, Netherlands. With over 15 years of experience, he has mastered the art of making IT and business communication less painful across various industries and countries. And Chris's mission to help technical and business teams communicate clearly has transformed the way organizations operate, making him the perfect guest to discuss today's topic. From the Netherlands, Chris, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Jack. It is a real pleasure to be here. Well, I really can't wait to share some of your insights and expertise with our listeners. But Chris, before we do, uh, before we get to the, the heart of today's conversations, I'd love to hear more about your journey and experiences. Could you further introduce yourself with our listeners and just share some of your highlights and insights over your career? Absolutely. So I didn't always teach communication skills. I started out in engineering of all places. Uh, I did an aerospace engineering degree and I worked for a a British defense company for the first few years outside of university. And then I went through a few major transitions over 20 years of employment. And I worked from defense and then telecoms and then health insurance, uh, travel industry for a while as well. And the common thread in all of those roles was involving some form of project or program management and some form of problem-solving role. And I was usually given those really big or unusual type of jobs, which other people weren't sure about, or they were the first time a company was approaching them. And it culminated in me doing merger and acquisitions and joint ventures for a huge US company. And the one constant was being able to bridge the gap between business and technical teams. So after a few years of being in the technical teams, I moved over into a joint technical business role and then fully into a business position. But I was always translating tech into business and vice versa. And then about four years ago, uh, around 2020, I left all of that behind and started focusing on writing and teaching practical communication skills with a particular focus on bridging that IT business divide. And uh, it's been an incredible experience. I've gone from being totally unknown to now being recognized with, as you mentioned, multiple awards, a best-selling book, and I get to work with all kinds of people and companies around the world. Well, that's awesome, Chris. Uh, What a great story and looking forward to learning more. So definitely excited to have you on the show. Clearly, your extensive background in effectively bridging the communication gap between technical and business teams means you have a great deal of wealth of expertise, not only facilitating smoother ERP integrations, but sharing with our listeners how to be a little more proactive in minimizing the risk. You know, Chris, I think one of the things we certainly have in common is how to bridge that gap between business teams and technical teams for sure. So your insight will undoubtedly be valuable for our listeners uh, seeking to improve cross-functional collaboration within their organizations. Uh, Listeners, all of us here at the ERP OCJ hope you find this podcast useful as we share lessons learned, discover best practices, and explore the human element components of ERP organizational change. And please stay with us till the end. Chris will give us his actionable golden nugget of advice based on today's conversation, and I will recap today's key discoveries and offer my suggestions on how to implement what we've learned. Our conversations on the ERP OCJ are built around the listen and learn approach. It's when you apply what you've learned that you begin to move the needle forward. So let's dive in. 
So Chris, uh, I have a two or three questions for you actually on bridging the IT business communications gap. So can you explain why communication between IT and business teams is often challenging and what the core issues are to begin with? Yes, yes. And this is a, a core focus for me, having lived it on both sides of the divide for many, many years. And some of the reasons why and the most common reasons we have this gap and the challenge between IT and business is a different mindset, different language, and different expertise in whichever teams we're talking about. And what I mean by that is take a, a software development team talking to the business users of the software that they, they build. Each team has a different level of need for specificity. They have a different level of need of ambiguity, particularly when starting a software development project. So let's say it was a marketing team and they were talking about what they needed. The marketing team has an idea of what they're trying to do at the end, but they don't have specifics. On the flip side, the software development team is all about specifics. Their mindset is about detail. It is about the logic. It is about specific requirements. And the marketing team isn't ready at that point to get to that level of detail. And that's not a failing of the marketing team. And it's also not a failing of the software team to be wanting the detail. It's a natural consequence of what drives those expertise areas. And then we bring in the different languages. Marketing experts will talk in marketing terminology and the software developers will talk in software terminology. And that difference in language causes a breakdown in communication or in fact, a breakdown implies that there was a link in the first place. What it actually causes is two teams speaking different languages and not being able to bridge that gap. Mm. So, Chris, then what would you say are some of the common misconceptions of IT professionals? Or, or I should say that the, some of the common misconceptions IT professionals have about business teams and vice versa. Uh, well, if I'm in IT... My perception, and I'm generalizing here, so I, I should add, start with a caveat of not everybody thinks these yeah. things. But if we're going to talk in broad strokes, which, which can be helpful, I in the software side or in the IT professional would say, well, business teams ask for too much. They have no idea of how long things take. They have no idea of complexity or what's even possible. They're vague. They change their minds too much. They don't know enough. And the list could go on. That's the problem with those pesky business people. And then if, if I was to flip it around, what the business teams often think is, well, IT, those IT folks, they're too rigid. They are unwilling to give estimates. They need way too much detail before it's available. And they just talk in jargon. I don't understand them. And those are what each team may believe. And unfortunately, while that's the evidence of what we see, it's not the root cause. It's not what each team is. It's what I mentioned before, the mindset, the language difference, the need for different levels of granularity in the detail that they share. So they're common misconceptions, even though it feels like it's the world that each team is living in. Got it. So, Chris, I intentionally ask you about, you know, what's the core issues and then what do some of these misconceptions look like that kind of create this core issue? But how do you assess the extent of the gap or can you? That is, how can organizations access the current state of communication between their IT and their business teams? <laughs> well, I, I laugh because the tongue-in-cheek answer is, well, just ask each team what they think of yeah. the other team. <laughs> right. And if they start talking in stereotypes, like, like I just did, if they start talking in stereotypes, there's a problem. If they talk about people by name, so if you're talking to one of the business teams, and they start talking about their supporting IT team, but they mention people by name or by the situation. And if they do it in a collaborative way, then the communication is good because they're dealing person to person, not them and us and using that team label. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned assessing, and I joke that we should just ask. One of the reasons that's not such a silly answer is there are hundreds of supposed team communication tests but there isn't a formal test of comms alignment or comms breakdown. And I wish there were. I suppose, well, maybe I should come up with one and I, I can standardize it across <laughs> the world. But there, there isn't one core test. The best way to assess the, the communication between the teams is to have a very candid conversation and listen to how they talk about each other. So, 
and, and I have to imagine, Chris, obviously that takes practice. That takes, you, you got to be deliberate, right? You got to have the intent to, uh, to listen in, in, a, in a way that's uh, helpful to understanding the, the extent of that gap. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I intentionally ask you, you know, when it comes to bridging IT versus business communication gaps, what are the issues to begin with? And then what are some of the common misconceptions? And then how can you assess that gap? Is it better in some organizations than others? And I would have to imagine that, yeah, there's a range of that gap. Absolutely, yes. So I think my, my next question then is, let's assume my organization has a significant gap. And based on your experience, what's the first step towards improving that gap or this communication? Well, the first step would depend on how bad the breakdown is and the root causes. So if, if there's a complete lack of trust and the teams are, they're almost verbally fighting with each other, then you have, you have to be approach that in a different way to the teams just don't understand each other. So I'm going to answer the question from the perspective of things aren't, aren't terrible. There's no fighting. There's just a lack of understanding. And to address that, the first step is for each team to learn how to speak the language the other teams will understand. Now, for example, an IT team should talk to their business teams to find out what the business team calls the system and process that the IT and technology supports. For example, if the business team says, oh, we work on the sales system, then the IT team should call it that, they should call it the sales system when talking to the business team. Even if it's made up of a dozen system layers, databases, APIs, all of that stuff in the background, yeah. Never talk about that to the business team. Learn what the business team calls the system and then use that language. And if they do it, the business team will understand it better, particularly if the IT folks then say, hey, there's an issue with the sales system rather than there's an issue with the JSON between system X and system Y. Because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, that's, that's meaningless. It's the wrong yeah. language. So learn to speak in the language the other team will understand. And the onus for that, the pressure is more on the technical folks because you're not going to teach business to speak IT. But the good news is business labels things pretty simply. So, so it only takes one or two conversations to be able to understand and find out what does the business team call this process? And then that gives a very common language that both sides can use and understand. Yeah. For effective communication, you have to be on the same, uh, you have to have the same language, right? Absolutely. Um, and the, wor the words really, really matter. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so on that point, actually, Chris, um, so to switch from recognizing the problem or the gap to effective communication, uh, let me ask you this. So in your book, The First Minute, you talk about starting conversations that get results. So can you share a key technique from that book that IT and business teams can apply? And, and I think your book does a great job with this, is a technique, like a tactical technique that your book, The First Minute, shares in order to help with uh, effective communication. Yeah, I, I think of the techniques in the book, and there are, there are a few, the one that, that best helps is creating a summary using a method called GPS, Goal, Problem, Solution. And it's a three-step summary, a three-step process to create a summary that anybody can understand. And... I'll, I'll give an example. So it's goal, problem, solution. If I was a business team talking to my IT support, I might say, our goal is to be able to produce weekly reports with all of the sales data from all of our agents. The problem is that process is manual at the moment, and I'm copying and pasting between spreadsheets. What I'd like as a solution is an automated report where I can just click a couple of buttons and that sales data is given to me. If the business team describes what they want in that summary approach, goal, problem, solution, it should make pretty clear sense to the tech support team. And it's also stripped out all of the background as to why I want it. And here's all the problems that we've been experiencing with our existing process. Like Strip all of that stuff out and just get to here's what I want to achieve. Here's the problem that's stopping me from achieving it. And here's where I'd like your help for the solution. Then... If the tech teams use the same approach, let's say talking about an issue in building that report, the tech teams might come back and say, hey, I know your goal is to have this automated report where you just click a button and it's produced. The problem is we're getting information from seven different systems and that's really complicated to pull together. What I want to talk to you about is can we have a two-step solution 
where instead of clicking one button, you click three buttons to make this work. Is that an okay solution? So it's summarizing at a very high level, but still stating the goal and the, that the end user wants. You talk about your problem in the terms that they understand, and then you're in the solution discussion. Yeah, got it. I would like to ask you a question, uh, maybe slightly change gears just a little bit, but you know, I recognize in our work how valuable email communication is, right? Most people communicate a great deal through email nowadays, but how important is the role of concise email communication as outlined in effective emails in bridging the IT business gap? Uh, first, I love that you've found my effective emails book. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's not a and common well, I, one. I should add, uh, Chris, that we will add that to our show notes as well. Um, oh, but it, it is that's actually a topic that we've discussed with other guests. And you know, I think sometimes the value of effective emails is underappreciated. So I uh, would love to hear what you have to say on that topic. Oh, yes. I, I'm with you 100%. It, the value of effective emails is undervalued. So you asked about what is the role of concise communication in, in email and how valuable is concision or short emails. I'd say, first of all, concise communication is good for everyone, no matter what the channel, whether this is verbal, email, posters, semaphore, whatever you're using, short is better. And specific to email, here's the reason short is best. First of all, emails that are too long won't be read, period. Anyone who gets, um, well, maybe not period, but uh, the chances of them being read are greatly reduced. Now, anecdotally, I could give an example where if you open an email and see it's really long, many people will close it and move on to the next short email with the good intention of coming back to the long one later, but they never quite manage to do that. That's the anecdotal evidence. The actual evidence comes from a great study done with the Boston Globe. The newspaper, the Boston Globe, did a study a few years ago where they sent an email out that was 149 words or 150 words. So not a lot, but 150 words. And they tracked who opened, how long it was opened for, and whether it was replied. Then they sent the same beginning and end of the email. They just chopped out the bit in the middle. So they took the 149 words and chopped it down to about 50 and sent that out. Now, they did this study with over 100,000 people. So it was a really good sample size. The read rate and the reply rate were almost double when the email was shorter. Mm. Mm. They didn't add anything. They didn't change anything. They just took out content from the middle. Almost double the read rate, almost double the response rate. Mm. That's, that's pretty valuable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the moral of the story is clearly articulate the purpose of the email in your ask. <laughs> Yeah, right, and yep, right up front. Yeah. Strip out the detail. One of the things that we we as humans do, this is very human nature, is we put in extra detail where we're talking, whether we're writing emails, and we put in extra detail for two reasons. One is we feel the other person needs to know all of this stuff to be able to answer the question. Whereas actually that's that's very rarely true. And the second is we want to demonstrate that we've done some work or there's evidence that we've put in the effort or tried lots of different things before asking for help or looking for the next step. And most of the time, we don't, as the recipients, we don't care. Like, okay, you want next Tuesday off work? Tell me you want next Tuesday off work. You don't have to give me the 73 reasons why you know, <laughs> your nan's dog walker fell over and this is happening. And Like, okay, right. you want next Tuesday off work? Start with that. If I have questions, I will let you know. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Chris, I, I would like to also ask you another question based on another one of your books. So from 39 Ways to Make Training Stick, can you suggest ways to ensure that communication training for technical teams has a lasting impact? Yes. And no. <laughs> so, uh, part of the reason I say yes and no is the answer will depend on the topic, on the group, on the tools available. And that's one of the reasons there are 39 ways in the book and actually more ways beyond that. But in every case, when you want communication training to stick, and we'll use the example of with tech teams, communication training will only stick when the methods taught are applied consistently over time. So using some of the specific methods from the book, 
there's something called accountability buddies, which let's say you and I had been in a training session together and we paired up to be accountability buddies to help each other do better. And what we would do is every couple of days after the training, you'd give me a call and say, hey, Chris, are you using the stuff that we've taught? And every time I heard you present, let's say it was presentation training, I would take some notes and give you some feedback. We commit to each other to help reinforce the training. So accountability buddies is a great way to do it. It's like having a training partner at the gym. You're more likely to go. You're more likely to do those extra reps. Yeah. Something else that can help is integrating the training with daily tasks. If you'd come to one of my workshops for how to get to the point and how to be clear and concise, towards the end of the session, we spend a bit of time working out what you can do to build the methods into your daily tasks. And it might be you create a template in Outlook. So every time you send a meeting invitation, it has specific labels already in the invitation. So you know and are reminded to put in the information that's valuable, that's important. So it's small things like that to help give repeatable application of what is taught over time. I like it. Quite practical advice in your book, I would say. And the, the 39 pointers, I think, are very, very uh, well considered. And, well, you. you know, it's like anything. You, you could read a book, you could go to training, but at the end of the day to apply that, and it's kind of like the purpose of this podcast, we mentioned this at the beginning of every podcast, when you can really reflect and, and apply what you've learned, that's when you really move the needle, right? And yes. so you yeah. know, I, I like your idea of the training buddy. It helps create accountability. It helps create the ability to put into practice, you know, with some support and a resource, what you've learned. So great yeah. insight. Oh, I've got, I've just thought of an example that is really relevant to something we've talked about already and to the audience. Can I share that? Yeah, of course, please. So we talked about GPS earlier, the goal problem solution. And when I was working for, was one of the leaders of a big IT department for a while, and they were adopting agile processes and having daily standups. And I suspect many of your listeners will be involved in daily standups or weekly yeah. standups of mm -hmm. one form or another. And GPS is a really good way to give your update in that stand-up meeting. So if the team decided to make that the default method to raise an issue or to give an update, hey, so our goal is to deliver this user story uh, during the next three days, the problems we're facing are X and Y, and here's what I'm going to do about it to solve it today. That gives a very simple framework. Then the team can reinforce each other during that stand-up and say, hey, Fred, you didn't, like, come on, use GPS. Don't give us all that background. What's the goal? What's the problem? And then give us two lines for a solution. And if the team finds it valuable, they can then use that method and support and remind and reinforce each other to make those stand-ups clearer and shorter. Mm, great advice. Great, great advice. It reminds me of some conversations we had. We had a couple of guests on talking about effective communication and effective meetings. You know, I think that's another area that's kind of underestimated and underemphasized within organizations. You know, just so you can check the box and say you had a formal meeting to discuss a topic, that doesn't mean that the meeting was effective and efficient. Oh, right? yes. Oh, and we, <laughs> we, I've done whole podcast episodes with people on this. I run, yeah. a, a, I run a full day training program. Uh, and, and varying short ones, I do sort of 90 minutes, half day and full day on having successful meetings. Yeah. It is so, so undervalued. Everybody has a bad meeting story and they often have more than one every day of the week. And yeah. yet we don't get taught how to run good meetings. You know, some of my pet peeves, Chris, are, you know, you get into a meeting and people are on phones and texting. Uh, they come in, you know, 10 minutes late to a half hour meeting. <laughs> mm. And, you know, it's just and, and then there's no agenda in the invite or whatever. You just you're not even sure what the agenda is. Uh, and then it's it's quite easy to go off tracks and you're talking about a topic and it's not even the original purpose of the meeting. Oh, um, yeah. You know, so, I, you know, I really think it, as simple as that may seem to some people, I think within an organization, I think that has a tremendous impact on the tone of even the organizational culture. Oh, it's huge. Um, it's so huge. It's, uh, yeah. I can give you three words that can solve that problem. What's that? Topic, purpose, and output. Yep. When you plan for a meeting, in one sentence, say, what is the topic? Another sentence, say, what is the purpose of the meeting? And then output, not outcome, but output, what will the meeting produce? And you yep. should be able to print it out or write it down. And it might be a decision, a list of ideas, 
a, a solution to a problem. But if you can say those three things and put them in the invitation, here's what happens. One, you know what the meeting's going to be about when you set it up. Two, everyone else who goes to the meeting knows what it's about and what they're going to be producing. Three, you've got your introduction already written. Hey, everyone, we're here to talk about this. The reason why, here's our purpose, and by the end, we'll produce this output. And then you've got everything you need to measure progress throughout the meeting. Are we making progress towards the output? We're halfway through the meeting. Are we halfway towards the output? Three words, massive difference in meeting effectiveness. And I would say, Chris, by doing that, in a way, you're creating a, what's the word, a bit of seriousness, if that's the right word, and, and intent and discipline to the meeting. Yeah. You know, you're, you're setting a tone right out of the gates that, look, this isn't a meeting to come in and check texts and come in late. I mean, or to waste anybody's time, frankly, it's meant to be a productive meeting. Here's what we're going to talk about. When you do that, you frame up the discipline in the way that the meeting is conducted, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. And people know why so. they're there. You know, yeah, hey, exactly. this, this project, this topic has nothing to do with me. Do I have to be here? You give people so much ability to self-select in or out with good, clear information. Yeah. Topic, purpose, output. Use those three things. It's a game changer. Well, Chris, because I enjoy learning from real world experiences, could you share, uh, maybe put you on the spot here a little bit, but could you share an example of a communication breakdown that you've helped resolve and what strategies you use to resolve that breakdown? Absolutely. And I, I assume you're looking for a work one, not me trying to negotiate ice cream portions with my daughter. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I've got lots of those stories. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at work, uh, I'll, I'll go back to the my agile days. And the situation is this. We were in a planning meeting on an agile program. And I realized that that is a contradiction saying agile and program, but that's a conversation for another, another time. So we're in a planning session, the business team, I could use air quotes here. The business team just wanted an extra couple of data columns on a report. And the problem was the data was not in an easily accessible data warehouse. It, was requ it would have required linking loads of legacy systems together. Not impossible, but definitely not a 10-minute job. And the problem that was happening in the meeting is the business and IT teams could not agree on what needed to be done and why it was not simple. And both sides were getting a mix of sort of heated discussion and then starting to shut down and check out from the conversation. Some people were just no longer involved at all. And other people were really getting quite heated in the way they were talking. And the reason was no, neither side understood what the other people were saying, what their questions were, what the requests were, or the explanations. So what I did was... Again, I use GPS. It's not, it's not a magic solution, but it, it certainly helps. And in this case, I used it to go step by step to gain an understanding of, of what each group needed. So first of all, what was each group's goal? And first, what was the business goal and what was the business problem? And then what was the IT team's goal, which was really to support the business, but the problem was they couldn't do it in the time frame the business wanted a solution for. And so bit by bit, I translated or I guess rephrased each team's sentences to ensure that it was coming across in a universally understandable way. And in the end, the IT team realized that they could understand what the business goal was and why it was important. And, and this is the really valuable bit, the business team understood why it wasn't as simple as just adding a couple of columns. Yeah. And which this is such a common scenario from, from my experience and listening to others that oh, I just want to add this button. But behind the scenes is a tangled web of 38 legacy systems. And so the key lesson for anyone facing this situation or something similar is break the topic down into really small pieces. Make sure that everybody is clear on what the business team's goal is before moving on. And make sure you understand what the business team problem they want to solve is. Then talk about what are the problems with achieving that goal from a technical perspective. But strip out the detail and find some way that both sides can say, yes, we understand and we agree with that statement, and then move on to the next bit of the conversation. Well, great example. Thanks, uh, Chris, for sharing that. I appreciate it. So, so far, we've talked about, you know, I've asked you a few questions on what is the gap exactly 
Uh, and then we talked a little bit about, you know, effective communication specifically. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about maximizing business value through communication. And, and maybe these questions are a little bit more in the context of NNA's practice, uh, to be selfish. So how can IT and business teams use communication to support mergers and acquisitions, uh, which is an area of expertise for Nestle and Associates? What's your thoughts there in that particular environment? Pretty dynamic, you know, high paced, you know, high pressure turnarounds expected pretty quickly, pretty high demands for for a lot of significant change in a short period of time. Typically, what would be your answer to that question? Yeah. So first, that is a huge question. How how long yeah. have we got? Pandora's um, box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an area that I do have some experience in. I, I even wrote a guide uh, with a, a wonderful co-manager, a lady called Tina Cox, an all-round awesome human being. And we wrote a guide for the company we worked at to help with future M&As. And from a comms perspective, these are, are the few the few pieces I would say. So three high level things for both business and technical teams. One, don't be precious about your stuff. Two, accept that change will happen. And three, describe things in language that other people will understand. And I'll, I'll give a little tiny bit more detail about each of these. So the first one, don't be precious about your stuff. Even if you think your systems or your processes are the secret source for your business, if you've been acquired or you're being merged, please, please be open to learning how the other team does it. How does the other company, how does the people you're merging with do it? You may learn something. You may be able to bring the best of each thing together. So don't be precious about your stuff. Learn about the other side. And then accept that change will happen. If you've been bought, there are definitely going to be changes. Uh, you may well need to shift absolutely everything to the buyer's systems. You may have to do a huge data migration, and that, that can really suck. But if you don't get on board with it, you'll spend the rest of forever trying to manage two separate or two badly coupled systems, and you'll create a legacy nightmare that nobody will be grateful for. So change is going to happen. So have the mindset of how can I best support the change and make it work? Do that rather than trying to block it. And that goes for business and for IT. I, I say systems and processes. They can be business systems and processes as well. So, Chris, um, in your previous uh, answer there uh, for your number two point uh, was to accept change. What role does effective communication play in managing organizational change, especially in the context of large scale ERP implementations or business systems implementations? It's critical. Effective communication is critical because without good comms, change fails, period. Bad comms equals failure of whatever you're trying to achieve in this organizational change. Now, when I say good comms, it doesn't mean everyone has to agree, but they do all need to understand. They need to understand the overall goals, understand the overall approach, understand how to tell each other what's happening as the implementation goes along. And I don't mean more status updates. I mean, connecting key people so that they can communicate within their teams. And this requires a full, full spread of communication techniques across a wide range of different communication situations. So we've got relationship building, status updates to executives, detailed planning for system integrations or data migrations, sharing of processes, solving problems, and so on. All of those situations require good communication. And to do it at a high level, we should be using similar language. So talking in terms of goals and problems, but also talking in terms of effort and outcomes rather than system names or data types. Yeah, I like that, Chris. It seems to me that effective communication can actually be a buzzword sometimes. Mm. And, and I like how you <laughs> described, you know, really it's all about, you know, it's a full spread of communication techniques and tactics that you can apply across a spectrum of communication scenarios, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think that's very well said, Chris, and I appreciate that. And, you know, I think sometimes what we see is some organizations and leadership will talk about effective communication, but they don't take it beyond some initial conversations, right? Uh, you know, maybe for some organizations, it's a, it's a memo, it's an organizational wide email, <laughs> you know, a couple mm. of times a month. Yeah. And I think it's important that that just doesn't do the trick. There's so many other tactics that you can take out of your effective communication toolbox and build it into your, your large scale organizational change plan 
and just really improve some of the examples you gave. And, you know, maybe it's a town hall, maybe it's a regular well-ran meeting, maybe it's just being consistent about having people understand the value of the pointers that you provided our listeners and don't be uh, protective about your stuff, accept change, use a language others will understand. So again, I I think it's one of those things that we alluded to earlier in the conversation, Chris, if you really want to be an effective communicator and you want your organization to be good at effective communication, it takes intent. You know, you have to be deliberate. And again, it goes back to your workout buddy, right? You know, just don't talk about it and read about it. Do something internally to put that mechanism in place in which to support and execute and enforce these principles and these tactics. So how... How can our clients, Nestle & Associates clients, which are private equity firms, how can private equity firms leverage improved IT business communication to maximize investment value in their portfolio companies? Uh, And again, I know that's intentionally a bit of a a large, a a broad question, but how can you kind of bring that down a little bit and speak in a little bit more layman terms for the private equity operating partner? Uh, what, what's the value? You know, we're sitting here, we're talking about effective communication and tactics and being deliberate. But at the end of the day, uh, how does that bring in value to the, the, you know, to the investors? Oh, yeah. The answer is actually quite simple and small. The investors should invest in it. And I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, what investors in an organization should invest money in training and invest time in helping the companies communicate well. And it pays dividends in all kinds of ways. The, for example, status updates from the company to the investors will become shorter, clearer, and contain more valuable advice and information. Teams internally will work better together, which delivers better outcomes for the business, which is what the investors want. In fact, I've recently been talking to a couple of venture capitalists about making certain types of communication training and support a condition of receiving funding. And the client company has to accept the time and effort it takes to work on their comms if they want the money from the VC. And it, it's not a full service yet, but there's there's interest and we're working on that. And the VC community has sort of definitely pricked its ears up because they recognize how valuable it will be just to have those shorter, clearer updates, how effective internal comms is and how effective uh, the businesses can be when the businesses can communicate with their clients, with their vendors, with their supply chains, and so on. So, Chris, I will say, you know, as you'd mentioned, uh, you say it pays dividends in all sorts of ways, I think was your exact comment. And I would say that's not just some abstract theory, right? I mean, it is proven, literally, you know, scientific peer-reviewed articles that organizations with a healthy culture, of which communication is a, is a significant attribute, there is a high correlation between those organizations that rate high in their organizational culture towards organizational performance. You know, I think that the data to support that is, it's well established and undeniable. It really yeah. is. And yeah. For a very specific example, the, the percentage of projects and programs that fail is something like 70%. It depends which year's study or, or which source you're looking at, but around 70% of projects and programs fail. The ones that don't fail generally have better communication levels within those organizations because risks and issues are communicated more clearly and they're understood. So they can be reacted to and planned for better because when we have shared understanding, we know what we should do about, or at least we have the right information to make good choices about risks and so on. So if investors want the projects within their their companies to succeed, then improve the communication. It's going to take a big step towards improving project and program success rates. If the communication is improved at all levels of the company, yeah, it can't work just at the top and not at the bottom, and it can't work just at the bottom or in the middle and not at the top. Communicating within a company requires a consistent approach to bring up that skill level across the board, but it's worth doing. Well, Chris, I, I really appreciate your time. And I do want to ask you two more questions here. And I don't think there will be much to add from your advice uh, shared so far, but just to kind of pull it together, you know, in the world of private equity, especially one where there's growth through mergers and acquisitions and, and rapid growth, can you share insights on how to maintain this improved communication as organizations evolve and grow under such conditions? 
your answer is probably going to be the same as we've discussed in the conversation so far, but yeah. under just a high growth environment, I mean, acquisitions, we, we actually have a client right now where over the last couple of years, they've added four to five uh, entities and that's their continued path for the next three years. Um, you know, so any, any advice in terms of the advice you've provided our listeners already so far, but does any of that change or is there anything to add in terms of a much accelerated growth environment? Yeah, I'll, I'll do this in four bullet points. First of all, make it important and make it valued. Second of all, train the managers as well as staff. We just talked about that. Train new hires. Don't accept backward steps when people come in. And then the fourth thing is how do you measure it? If, show me the measurements in a company and I'll show you where the problems are in performance because people work to the measures. Well, that's great. Great, Chris. Uh, great advice. And so, hey, um, before I let you go, and I do appreciate your time, I'm going to ask you my favorite question. Given all that we've discussed today, can you summarize the key takeaways with our listeners and what should they remember? I mean, based on these insights, what is the single most valuable piece of advice that Chris would offer our listeners as they navigate their journeys and bridging the, the communication gap between IT and business teams, and especially in the world of successful ERP implementations? What's that golden nugget that Chris would leave our listeners with? The golden nugget is this, and it's two sentences. Many communication issues occur because we don't communicate from the other person's perspective. So take a moment, think about how the other person thinks and speaks, what is important to them, and adjust your message to use their language and be from their perspective. Yeah. And Chris, I would say again, listeners, I encourage you to really think about that and really what that means and how you can uh, apply that insight to actual practice. Good golden nugget. Well, listeners, as promised, that wraps up another insightful episode. Uh, we've explored effective ERP communication strategies for business to IT alignment. Uh, we dove to the importance of bridging the communication gap between IT and business teams. And with Chris's expert guidance, we've uncovered practical techniques and strategies from starting meaningful conversations to ensure training sticks and aligning communication with business goals. And so I encourage all of our listeners to apply what you've learned today and move the needle forward in your own ventures, whether you're leading an ERP implementation, managing organizational change, or simply striving for better collaboration between your IT and business teams. Remember that effective communication is the key to success. Chris, thank you again for your time. I do appreciate it. I appreciate your dedication. But before we go... Can you tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you? And we'll certainly uh, include this information in our show notes. Absolutely. So my social hangout is LinkedIn. Come and connect with me. You can ask me any questions. I will answer them. And if you're interested in what I do, check out chrisfenning.com. And if you look at the references section, there is a ton of free content and courses and helpful stuff that you can use. So chrisfenning.com, and you'll, you'll find out oh, a lot about good, clear communication. Awesome. Well, Chris, I, I know it's 8 p.m. on a Friday night in, at your home in the Netherlands, uh, so I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you again. Uh, be well, and, uh, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Jack. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the ERP OCJ podcast. This podcast is intended as a forum to study, share, and discuss ERP organizational change successes and challenges. Mm -hmm.